The Middle East is a powder keg, and with tensions flaring between Israel and Yemen, the stakes have never been higher. What would happen if these two nations, one a military powerhouse, the other backed by a volatile network of Iranian proxies, were to collide in a full-scale war? With Israel's superior technology and Yemen's strategic alliances, the battlefield would be anything but predictable. But who comes out on top in this dangerous game of geopolitical chess, and how could this conflict reshape the entire region? Let's break it down. Throughout the conflict, it's become clear that Israel's position has rapidly escalated from warring a single entity inside Palestine to waging a proxy war against Iran and its axis of resistance. The axis is made up of Arab militant groups in Syria, Lebanon, Palestinian territories, as well as Yemen. Iran keeps funding and sending military equipment to these groups to avoid openly confronting Israel in an all-out war, an act which would inevitably pull in Israel's allies, such as the US. The sheer scale of Iran's involvement is difficult to quantify, but some of its effects have been pretty clear. Iran wants Israel's forces and investments scattered across its neighbors without provoking the US. To that end, Yemen has proven to be one of the more effective staging grounds for interfering with Israel, particularly due to its location. Yemen's favorable position on the south of the Arabian Peninsula allows it direct access to the Bab el-Mendeb, one of the entrances to the Red Sea, the other being the Suez Canal. This has allowed the Iranian-backed military faction in Yemen, the Houthis, to block off Israeli ships passing through the strait, threatening Israeli trade with the east. In late 2023, when the conflict between Israel and Hamas reached the peak media presence, there were several instances of Houthis' piracy against ships, with the majority of them targeting Israeli vessels specifically. In response, the US and the UK launched missile strikes on Yemen territory in early 2024, as well as increasing overall ship presence surrounding the Red Sea and the Arabian Peninsula. Specifically, January 11th saw the US launching around 100 missiles, trying to destroy 16 Houthi military sites in the area. The shelling didn't stop there, with missile strikes continuing in several waves to deter the Houthis from taking additional hostile actions against either Israel or NATO. At the time, the Biden administration was scrutinized for what was sometimes even considered an overreaction. For a while, it was believed that these acts would prompt the US to make more significant movements against Iran, since it's the country that's been supporting the Houthis' movement in Yemen for decades. In the following months, the US frequently took down missiles and drones that the Houthis launched or were preparing to launch against either Israel or ships in the Red Sea. However, these measures didn't deter the Houthis from making their presence known to Israel. Over the past nine months, the Houthis have launched dozens of attacks on various ships, which has caused significant physical damage to the ships and economic damage to the trade in the region. The Suez Canal has reported a 23% revenue decrease in the 2023-24 fiscal year, as the number of ships passing through has decreased due to fear of being attacked. Furthermore, since the alternative trade route passing below the Cape of Good Hope is roughly 3,500 nautical miles longer and lasts between 8 and 12 days, the crisis on the Red Sea has pushed product prices for consumers and delivery prices for transport services. Apart from trying to affect Israel through ship blockades and piracy, Houthis have been using Iran-supplied missiles to launch strikes against the south of Israel. The main target for the attacks on the Israel land have been concentrated on the southern city of Alat. Alat is Israel's only port on the Red Sea, so crippling it would force Israel to conduct trade solely through the Mediterranean, where it's heavily contested by Lebanon and Syria to the north and Palestinian forces to the south. Additionally, areas surrounding Alat are some of the most viable for solar energy production in the country. Hitting Israeli solar plants would force Israel to be more dependent on foreign coal and oil imports, pushing it further against the self-imposed goal of eliminating coal imports by 2030. Due to the aforementioned ship piracy and attacks, the port of Eilat actually declared bankruptcy in July 2024, mainly due to the inability to conduct trade via the Red Sea. With the activity in the port dropping by 85%, the Israeli government has started to directly support the port, cutting into the country's economic prosperity. Of course, most of the missiles and drones that Yemen, or more precisely the Houthis, have launched in the past year have yielded little effect. The Israeli air defenses, backed by US intelligence and preemptive strikes, have largely been enough to protect it against airborne threats coming from Yemen. But all that changed on July 19, 2024. That's when the first strike from Yemen managed to reach Israel. A drone launched by the Houthis hit a building all the way in Tel Aviv. The Houthis immediately claimed responsibility for the attack and boasted that the newest drone model they used was finally capable of bypassing interception systems maintained by Israel and the US. The strike killed one Israeli citizen and injured several more, making them the first casualties from Houthi missile strikes on Israeli land. According to a spokesperson from the Israeli Defense Force, or the IDF, the drone is purported to be a Samad 3 model made in Iran, shipped to Yemen, and then modified to have its range upgraded so it could reach Tel Aviv. 
However, there's still uncertainty over whether there are any systems failures that allowed the drone to bypass air defenses. At the same time, the IDF intercepted a second drone that was launched simultaneously with the first one. Israel immediately responded with a show of overwhelming force. A day later, an Israeli aircraft barraged al hadaida the fourth largest city in Yemen and one of the country's most important ports. The parts of the port that were hit were used by the Houthis for military purposes, but some targets were also chosen due to their potential for both civilian and military functions. The assault on the port of al hadaida is important for a few reasons. First, it's one of the vital import ports for substances such as food and oil that are desperately needed in the country. Yemen is one of the poorest Arab countries and has been in the midst of a raging civil war between the Houthis and the government of the Republic of Yemen, which is an entity recognized by the United Nations, as well as a few other smaller parties such as the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda. The port is a part of a territory occupied by the Houthis and one of the few ways they can receive material from overseas. Delaying imports of food to Houthi forces can devastate the revolutionary government's morale. Secondly, the port has also been noted for importing Iranian weapons into the country. As such, hitting its military compounds has likely reduced the potential for the Houthis to launch strikes both on Israel and on ships in the Red Sea. The ultimate goal of such a strike would be to end the Red Sea crisis, but the Houthis haven't been dissuaded from their attempts of piracy. Spokespersons from the Houthis movement claim that their attacks on Israel are acts of solidarity with the Hamas-led Palestinians. Thirdly, the attack on the port was one of the longest-range strikes that the Israeli forces have performed in history, with al hadaida being over a thousand miles away. This showcases the potential offensive capabilities of Israeli forces when operating far away from mainland Israel. However, all things considered, Yemen is a relatively minor enemy due to the logistical difficulties of mounting a meaningful strike force. So far, Israel has received significantly more military pressure from nearby Iran-backed factions such as Hezbollah, and the country's ongoing efforts to eliminate the Hamas resistance have pitted it against Iran diplomatically. Iran is a much more severe threat than the Houthis would ever be. This is evidenced by the faction's main methods relying on disrupting trade across the Red Sea and mounting repeatedly ineffective drone and missile strikes, at least until the first one hit in July. Of course, while the geopolitics surrounding Iran and Israel have likely been at an all-time low for the past year, neither country is exactly eager to make the first move against the other. Israel is still backed by the US diplomatically and militarily. Even when you consider that Iran is one of the regional powers, a bulk of this power is being projected through the military factions that it is funding. If Iran decides to declare an official war against Israel, there are good chances the US will retaliate rather quickly. Additionally, not all of the Muslim world shares Iran's sentiment of Israel. Both Saudi Arabia and Egypt have taken mainly neutral stances on the entire Israel-Hamas conflict, refusing to take in refugees from Gaza and closing their borders whenever possible. Saudi Arabia has been adamant about forcing Israel to devise a workable two-state solution with Palestinians before they could make headway on officially allying with Israel. Saudi Arabia seems to be eager to work with Israel and the US to stabilize the Middle East, but this would likely come at the expense of obtaining nuclear and military technology that the US has to make the kingdom even more of a leader in the Middle East. Simultaneously, Saudi Arabia is one of the potential beneficiaries of China's Belt and Road Initiative, aimed at providing China with more direct, land-based access to Middle Eastern oil reserves. This gives Saudi Arabia the ability to avoid making rash decisions and bide their time and see how the conflict between Iran and Israel plays out. As a result, Saudi Arabia is likely going to remain a sternly neutral party in the ongoing crisis, which might play out in Israel's favor over the long run. A part of that is because the Houthis will remain cut off from a direct route to Israel, making them relatively small players in the overall scale of the conflict in the Middle East. Without Iran's backing, there probably wouldn't be any prolonged or large-scale conflict between Israel and Yemen. First, the official government of Yemen is effectively under pressure from the Houthi militia. If Israel actually declared war against Yemen, it would primarily be to defeat the Houthis. It's currently uncertain how that would affect geopolitics in the region since the Houthis aren't a UN-recognized leader of the country, instead being labeled as a terrorist group within Yemen. Therefore, Israel would likely be able to declare war on Yemen, which would play out similarly to the US war on terrorism after 9-11. This would spark a series of conflicts across the Middle East as other Iran-backed factions would increase their pressure on Israel, likely in support of the Houthis. However, let's consider a hypothetical scenario where Israel directly declares war on the Houthis or Yemen itself without international backlash from Iran. How do the two countries compare militarily? Let's start with the purely demographic side of the equation, the country's populations and manpower reserves. According to the most recent census and demographic data, Yemen has a population of roughly 33 million, out of which 8.8 .8 million can be considered fit for military service, males and females aged 16 to 49 who are not disqualified due to health reasons. The country itself might use a different condition, such as not allowing women in the armed forces, which could conceivably cut that number by half. 
By contrast, Israel's population is roughly 9.5 million in total, with the available military manpower at roughly 3.1 million. However, Israel has a much more developed military than Yemen. Israel maintains a standing force of roughly 170,000 troops, compared to Yemen's 66,000. Additionally, Israel keeps a reserve of nearly half a million soldiers, while Yemen doesn't have a reserve at all. If we remove Yemen's official forces from the equation, the numbers become even more skewed in Israel's favor. According to the most recent estimates, the Houthis have roughly 20,000 troops. This might not be an entirely accurate measure, though. Some reports indicate that the Israel-Hamas conflict has allowed the Houthis to recruit more people from the general population, while the rebels themselves claim they've recruited 200,000 people since the start of the Gaza conflict, this number likely doesn't translate directly into bolstering their military size. On the military equipment side of things, Israel also maintains a hefty advantage, regardless of whether we're looking at Yemen's official government or the Houthis. According to most official sources, Israel has roughly 1,370 tanks compared to Yemen's 55. Additionally, the tank on Israel's side are likely to be newer versions due to Israel being able to modernize its military according to near US standards. There are no direct reports of Houthis controlling tanks or the size of its tank arsenal, which makes it difficult to compare numbers with either Israel or the Yemen government. In total, the Israeli military has roughly 43,400 armored land vehicles, while the Yemen side has only 4,800. This makes Israel much more capable of mounting land-based attacks on hostile territory. Given enough air support and transport capabilities, Israel might feasibly airdrop their vehicles and create military zones in Yemen, much like the US did with Afghanistan and Iraq in the 2000s. Israel also leads in other land military equipment categories such as anti-tank guns, 120 versus 80, and manned portable anti-tank missile launchers, 55,000 versus 5,200. Again, no numbers for the Houthis' movement exist for these, making them impossible to compare directly. It's unlikely that the Houthis don't have any tanks or land anti-tank mechanisms, as they wouldn't be able to control a third of Yemen's territory otherwise, but it's possible that the numbers are not far off Yemen's government numbers or even lower. In either case, Israel maintains a significant advantage in land forces if they actually clash against one another. Since this is currently nigh impossible, the countries are separated by the entirety of Saudi Arabia, both sides will likely heavily underutilize their land equipment. In terms of air power, Israel also has a significant lead, which has been proven by the country's near-immediate response to a Houthi drone attack on July 22, 2024. Israel maintains 241 fighter aircraft, while Yemen has 53. Furthermore, the most advanced fighter aircraft on the Israeli side is the US-made F-35 Lightning II, while Yemen uses the Russian Shukhoi Su-22s. While F-35s are considered among the most modern fighter jets available, the S-22s have largely been made obsolete by newer Russian models. Even if the S-22 itself is an export upgrade over the base Su-17, its combat capabilities are far below that of a modern F-35. The Yemen government also hasn't had particular success when using their S-22s over the years, with at least six aircraft shot down between 2009 and 13 as part of Yemen's ongoing effort to fight the Houthi insurgents. On the Houthi side, there are no accurate reports on what kind of aircraft the group has available. The only unveiling was that of a restored F-5 aircraft in 2023, a model that can't compete with F-35s in any way. Houthis might have additional aircraft that were provided by Iran. Saudi Arabia has been on an aggressive campaign to prevent the militant group from obtaining viable aircraft pieces for the past eight years. As a result, the number of aircraft the Houthis can operate is unlikely to surpass single digits. Apart from the aforementioned fighter aircraft, Israel also maintains much larger stocks of other aircraft. These include multi-role aircraft, 241 for Israel versus 53 for Yemen, attack aircraft, 39 for Israel versus 23 for Yemen, transport aircraft, 12 for Israel versus 8 for Yemen, special mission aircraft, 23 for Israel versus 2 for Yemen, and helicopters, 146 for Israel, 48 attack helicopters versus 61 for Yemen, 14 attack helicopters. In all these categories, Israel's most advanced aircraft are more advanced versions of Yemen's, so not only does Israel maintain a numerical advantage, but a technological one too. Israel also has much better logistical and strategic air support. Its air force includes 14 air tankers, 11 aerial satellites, and 155 trainer aircraft. By comparison, Yemen has only 30 trainer aircraft. This means that Israel can mount an offense from the sky and make its troops far more experienced in aerial or air-to-land combat patterns. Considering the geographical and geopolitical difficulty of land combat between the two countries, air forces will likely be one of the two main avenues of Israel exerting military superiority over Yemen. And again, there are no credible reports of Houthis having any direct aerial presence, with the bulk of their offensive capabilities relying on surface-to-air or surface-to-sea missiles that Iran has been steadily providing over the past decade. 
The second main avenue where Israel and Yemen, or the Houthis, might clash directly is naval combat, since both countries have access to the Red Sea. It should be noted that the Israeli naval force is largely situated in the Mediterranean and would need to pass through the Suez to reach Yemen. Numbers-wise, it's again Israel that maintains an advantage. Israel's fleet strength is 67 vessels compared to Yemen's 38. Israel also has access to five submarines while Yemen has one, and has seven corvettes compared to Yemen's two. Israel also has nearly double the number of patrol vessels, 45 versus 23, but it's likely that most of these will be left in the Mediterranean. Yemen does have a slight defensive advantage since it has three mine-protected ports, all of which have relatively quick access to the Red Sea, while Israel's only port on the Red Sea is Eilat. But remember that Israel was capable of bombing al hadida with relative ease, so it's likely that it can also provide adequate air support for incoming naval forces. On the other hand, if the Houthis manage to inflict damage to Eilat and Egypt prohibits Israel from moving its naval forces across the Suez, the country's naval powers might get neutralized unless another power, such as the US, intervenes. All these statistics point to the fact that if Israel was in the position to directly wage war against Yemen, or more precisely the Houthis, the conflict likely wouldn't last long and would end in Israel's favor. However, as you might have guessed by now, the geopolitics surrounding Israel and Yemen are unlikely to make that a reality. Enter Iran. Iran is one of the biggest geopolitical players in the Middle East, largely due to its sizable oil and gas reserves that it's exporting to Eastern Asia. While Iran is technically sanctioned by the US, prohibiting them from oil and gas trade, the country has been able to skirt these sanctions for decades. This has made the hydrocarbon industry one of the driving factors behind its economic and subsequent militaristic progress. As a result, the country's military heavily outnumbers and outguns Israel's. To bypass international diplomatic concerns, Iran has also been investing in various paramilitary organizations in other countries in the Middle East, particularly in the aforementioned Lebanon, Syria, and Yemen. Therefore, Iran has been partially responsible for the civil wars that have been raging in these regions for years. As one of the primary economic and military supporters of the Houthi movement, Iran's interest is to keep the current status quo in the war-torn country. By providing the Houthis with long-range missiles, Iran has been claiming non-interference in the ongoing Palestine conflict, instead letting its proxy organizations take all the responsibility and the subsequent fallout from Israeli, British, and American bombings that have taken place over the past year. Therefore, if Israel were to launch a direct attack against Yemen or the Houthis, it would likely receive retaliations from other proxy groups, which are much closer than Yemen itself. Additionally, Iran has been posturing or making hostile actions itself. In the past few months, Israeli bombings against proxy terrorist groups have killed a few Iranian generals, which has soured already negative relations between the two countries. Despite all this, Iran doesn't seem like it wants to wage an all-out war against Israel either, particularly due to the imminent threat of the US joining Israel's defense. Therefore, Iran's posturing will likely come in the form of organizing its proxy groups to become more effective at spreading Israel's aerial defenses thinner and trying to land more hits on vital targets, such as the one made by the Houthis earlier. While Israel's defenses so far have proven incredibly efficient at taking down missiles and drones, a more concentrated effort from all sides with a more randomized attack pattern and lower cruise altitudes might yield a result. Speaking of the US's involvement, it's likely that Iran doesn't actually want to escalate the current crisis any further. The current Iranian government is heavily relying on the oil and gas trade, which is already under significant pressure from US sanctions. Therefore, any direct offensive moves or escalations would likely bury the country in more economic sanctions and isolate it internationally. While Iran's oil reserves are significant on the global stage, 9.5% of the world's resource availability, the country only accounts for 3.3% of all global exports by volume. Saudi Arabia and Iraq are two of its immediate neighbors with a much more significant export surplus in capabilities, and the former is unlikely to ally with Iran if things go south. Therefore, all Iran can feasibly do for now is send more missiles and reinforcements to its proxies to prolong the crisis in Israel. Neither side is willing to go to war with the other, as doing so will likely create irreparable harm to their geopolitical connections. Simultaneously, the Red Sea crisis has the potential to severely impact trade over the Suez Canal. As mentioned, its profits were already down 24% compared to the previous year, creating a sort of closed loop where neither side can make feasible progress towards their efforts. Despite all that, the Houthis seem to be even gaining ground politically, as their attacks haven't wavered despite heavy involvement from both Israel and the US. Saudi Arabia has been keeping a tenuous peace between the Houthis and the official Yemen government, creating a coalition of Arab countries to prevent the terrorist organization from acquiring more personnel and military equipment, which has obviously only been partially successful so far. Additionally, if the recent reports of Houthi movements and recruitment drives in the support of the Hamas-led Palestinians are true, it's possible that the Houthis may have amassed a critical number of troops to try to overtake the rest of Yemen. 
This would dissolve peace attempts by Saudi Arabia and the UN, likely forcing them to intervene again and plunge the country into chaos. Unsurprisingly, this could solve some of Israel's problems. Without the long-distance strikes from the south, Israel would have one fewer front to worry about. If the Houthis were dealt with, the Red Sea crisis would end, bouncing back the trade across the Suez Canal. Israel's port on the Red Sea would be open for business, allowing the country to diversify its trade and prevent itself from being locked to the Mediterranean, where it can be contested by Lebanon and Syria. Considering the logistical difficulty of either side making a direct move, all we can do now is wait to see how the Middle Eastern conflict plays out. If Israel decides to ramp up its offensive strikes on Iranian proxy groups, it could plunge the region into escalating conflicts and force the US to choose a course of action. If Iran decides to make moves against Israel, it would effectively be declaring war on the US, which would again force a reaction. The Biden administration has notably been adamant about scaling down its operations in the Middle East, considering that it's ended the years-long war on terror without meaningful results. The renewal of the Middle East conflict could turn the tide on US policies, which could also have worldwide consequences. But what do you think about Israel's position and the ongoing conflict between Israel, Hamas, and Iranian proxies? How do you think the situation will progress? Leave your comments down below and thank you for watching.